off of it. We don't have it on yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here's your blank points. Oh, you're, this is, that's for the uh, video. So today has been a day to, to look at, uh, you know, some future trends and what's going on. And we're going to be looking at now at some future trends in education, in educational delivery, in schools, and how this starts impacting what we do and how we do it and who does it. And Karen McVeigh here is the uh, superintendent from the ISD, Ottawa County ISD. And uh, I just, you know, I've gotten to know Karen uh, a fair amount here in the last five or six years. And uh, I've just really been impressed with a lot of stuff that the ISD has been doing. And so what I'd like to do to start with here is maybe just have Karen introduce herself and tell the audience a little bit about who you are. Thanks, Bill. And it's just an absolute pleasure for me to be here today. I really appreciate this opportunity to share a couple thoughts with you as we go through this presentation. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful job being in an ISD like ours. We have a lot of resource uh, to do some great things, hopefully, in the community. First place, how many people know what an ISD is? How many don't? Wow. Oh my gosh, my kids don't know what I do. Um, I'm impressed. Could you come to Thanksgiving dinner this year and explain it to them? Um, and they're 26 and 23, so they're now little kids. Um, uh, for the few of you who don't know, an ISD is a, is a regional educational service area. The entire state's broken down into 56 ISD districts, and every local district is part of an ISD regional area. Um, you know, it's interesting, we're, we're talking about graded and, and stuff. ISDs and the, low, the current <coughs> configuration of school districts in the state of Michigan has only been around for about 50 years. It, it's not all that old. Um, so, uh, we happen to be in a really good area with really good relationships with our schools. Um, I have a lot of um, history in Zealand, uh, good history I hope. Uh, as you were going through your new high school arrangement a few years ago, uh, Gary Feaster invited me in to facilitate two community processes. Uh, the first was the naming of the two new high schools. <laughs> And I, I know there's some of you who are thinking right now, really? How good could she be? Zealand East and Zealand West? Uh, but if, let me tell you, that was a journey um, with about 120 community members to get through. Were any of you part of that process? Oh, my goodness. Thank you for wearing your um, uh, varsity jackets to those meetings. Um, anyway, the, the second community process that Gary asked me to facilitate was the naming of the second mascot. Oh. Yep. So um, there are, you know, I don't do as much group facilitation work anymore because of my job. I, I used to do far more of it before I was superintendent, but um, occasionally I still get an opportunity to facilitate group process and people, you know, say, oh, this is going to be really rough. It's an emotional issue. And I said, until you have walked down the ducks and the chicks. <laughs> you have no clue what emotional issues are all about. So, Zealand has always been near and dear to my heart uh, as part of this ISD for 30 years now. And what you may not know as community members is that this is rare. This is very rare. Where a community, a school district comes back again and again to its community and says, here's the challenge ahead of us. We need your guidance on the next steps. That's not lip service. Not only do I work in the 11 school districts in this ISD, but I talk with folks all over the state. This level of community support, interest, cultivation, and respect is rare. And it is one of the things that I have always respected about Zealand. Uh, and I'm just so appreciative to continue to be and a part of that and have an opportunity to spend some time with you today. So very long Great. I no, that's you. great. Hey, thanks, Karen. And Karen and I are going to kind of work back and forth here. And there's, from one day to the next, I'm not sure which slides I'm doing, which one she's doing. So uh -oh. we'll, actually, uh, we'll actually kind of work together here. Okay, so this was, the, uh, this was what Sarah was talking about. Here's the 10 guys back in 19, 1892, right? And a lot of the pattern of what we have for schools today was set then. Okay, we've already heard this, okay? And uh, basically, you know, a lot of the focus was on creating, uh, uh, you know, career-ready workers. And, you know, also the, the whole ISD, you know, a big major part of the mission there is dealing with uh, career ed. And, you know, I, 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 I want to 
pick up a little bit on what Sarah was saying and, and uh, actually kind of build on this just a little bit. Because, you know, she talked about the ag society and yet we're still, you know, we got farmers out there today and the industrial society and we're still manufacturing, right? But, you know, it's, it's really interesting when you look at this and you, and you look at it today. You know, one of the very first school projects I put together was here in Michigan. It was Langsburg Schools, which is a suburb of uh, Lansing, if you want to call it that. It's a little ways out that way, but and it's, it's an ag community. And we're trying to put together what should this school be. And of course, you know, when we, not of course, but when we sat down with the staff and everything else, and you know, they wanted to build the ag shop, and they wanted to build, you know, pretty much the same things that they had in their old high school. So I brought in the farmers, and I said, okay, so talk, talk to us about what you're doing. And they says, well, we're driving, uh, you know, tractors, some of them are $200,000 and up. You know, they have GPS on them, and they have linkages to the uh, Chicago Futures or whatever, so we know what the yields are. And, you know, we're doing, you know, embryo transplants and genetic engineering on cattle, and we're doing a lot of chemicals constantly on, uh, you know, of course, that's a whole other topic, but... You know, on, on food stuffs, and I'm going, well, you're not a farmer anymore, you're an information worker. So then, you know, watching Bruce's uh, uh, slides, and, you know, even going back is what I mentioned about, uh, you know, General Motors back in uh, early 1970s, and uh, uh, how, many, uh, how, many, how many people did you see uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the manufacturing line in, uh, in his slides or his video? I didn't see any. It was, it was all automated. And so, you know, the, in, the industrial worker, the manufacturing worker, has become the information worker, too. And then when you look at the service sector, you know, most of you in this room are in the service sector. There's teachers, there's architects, there's uh, various <laughs> business leaders. And the service sector is really split into two, two subsectors. It's the have sector and the have not sector. And the have sector, are the ones that have the education and have the ability to use technology, et cetera, and the have-not sector are the ones that don't have the education and don't have the ability to use technology. And so I'm not going to sit here and try to convince everybody it's all about technology, but it's all about technology. And I don't want you to necessarily try to agree with everything I've got to say, but when I see all this stuff and have been seeing it for the now, what, last 10, 20, 30 years, this whole paradigm that was established in 1992, the relevancy of this paradigm, was, which was really to sort and select students. And, uh, you know, basically in 1900, only 10% or thereabouts of the students graduated from high school because that's all the economy wanted to graduate from high school. Can you imagine 4,000 people on, on a Ford Motor assembly line all wanting to make decisions? No, they wanted people to do a certain task, a very specific task, day in and day out, and that was the, 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 the whole sector of what we lived in. And now what we keep seeing, when I listen to Bruce, is that you know, the bar's been raised. I don't think so much the educational system's gotten worse. The bar has been raised, it's been raised, it's been raised, and it's constantly being raised, and it's being raised again. That's what I see. And, uh, and, and, and basically what happens is it's difficult to deliver the way we did before in, in order to attain the results that we're now looking for. So a lot of people are saying, have we really changed? And this is a very interesting discussion. You know, are we basically doing the same thing we did 50 and 60 years ago, but maybe we're doing it a little slicker than what we did back then? Or are we really doing it differently? And I think that by and large, we're doing it the same. And, uh, and, and this whole issue of trying to do it differently it has become a, a big challenge. So uh, Sarah showed a, a slide on a, video, a quick video on this. I'm going to show one. Uh, and, and basically, I'm not, I don't know that I necessarily agree with everything this guy says. Okay, don't get me wrong. But <laughs> it's interesting what he's going to say here about creativity. And, it's, and uh, whatever the term he uses here, I've got to look back at it. And the other one is it's interesting what he says about how we organize and deliver education. So let's just play this for a second. This will only take about uh, a few minutes.
Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on Earth Earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which is if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. Some people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, I mean, I, I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you could get educated by Jesuits, you know, if if you had the money. But public education, paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery, that was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children, to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write, and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the Enlightenment view of intelligence. That real intelligence consists in this capacity for a certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally, what we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education, that there are really two types of people, academic and non-academic, smart people and non-smart people. And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not, because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced, and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America, or prescriptions for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis... And for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for their attention from every platform. Computers, from iPhones, from advertising holdings, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? You know, boring stuff. (laughs) At school for the most part. It seems to me it's not a coincidence totally that the incidence of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. Now, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit disorder 
increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. (laughs) They can hardly think straight in Arkansas. And by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. And there are separate reasons for that, I believe. (laughs) It's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts, and I don't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of maths, but let me, I say about the arts particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak. When you're present in the current moment, when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children through education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. I believe we have a system of education that is modelled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Schools are still pretty much organised on factory lines, ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialised into separate subjects. Um, We still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are. You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. You know what I mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines. You know, or at different times of the day. Or better in smaller groups than in large groups. Or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula. And it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking. Published a couple of years ago. Divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edward de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways, uh, to see multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of cod example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paper clip? Well, those routine questions. Most people might come up with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come up with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paperclip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paperclip as we know it, Jim? You know. Um, now, they're tested this, and they gave them to 1,500 people. This is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested of the 1,500 scored at genius level for divergent thinking. Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80, okay. 98%. Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, age of 8 to 10. What do you think? 50? They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can't you? (laughs) Now, this tells an interesting story. Because you could have imagined it going the other way. Couldn't you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is, we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that happened to them, I'm convinced, is that by now, they've become educated. You know, they've spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. 
And don't copy, because that's cheating. I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. You know, but <laughs> inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think differently about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth. Uh, secondly, we have to recognize that most great learning happens in groups, that collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution and the habitats that they occupy. You know, we talk about innovation. Do we really change? Do we not change? Should we change? If so, what kind of change should there be? The, uh, um, so what I'd like to do is turn it back to Karen for a couple minutes and talk about uh, some of the initiatives that she's been working with. Thanks. So um, a few years ago, we were actually exploring this exact question uh, with a little bit of an carrot in there about career and technical education. Uh, it was, the year was about 2007. A number of things were happening. It, just so you know, ISDs, um, we, we operate the Caroline Tech Center. It's one of our facilities. Uh, every day, about 1,500, 1,600 kids come through the door, 28 um, career training programs. Uh, they'll spend half a day there for a year or two years, depending on their ability and um, and what they've got to get done in high school. Um, so by 2007, though, a couple things were happening. We, we were ready to, we were poised and ready to expand the tech center to the tune of about $10 million, uh, major expansion renovation. And, and the, we don't bond for construction. We actually save our money and pay cash. I know, who does that? <laughs> but that's what we did. And uh, so we had about $10 million in the bank, and we were getting ready to have this expansion. And a couple things were happening. One, um, the state of Michigan had rewritten all of its high school graduation requirements. And because of that, we started to wonder how many students would continue to be able to access current technical education in that format. Uh, the other thing that was happening uh, was just this whole changing nature of how we were doing things and kids coming from you know, one set of bricks and mortar to another set of bricks and mortar. And, and was that the way? Or did we need to be more nimble and more regional? And did we need to think differently about how current technical education should be delivered given the fact that we were moving, we were already into a new century. Uh, and then the third thing that happened, and this happened later in 2008, was the economy tanked. And everything that we thought we knew about anything was pretty much rewritten. Uh, you know, jobs, I mean, I, I love Bruce Loss, he's a great friend, but his third ship went down. Uh, there, was a lot, there was a loss of manufacturing in this region as well. And kids lie. I mean, did anybody grow up hearing your home is the only investment you will ever make that will always rise in value? <laughs> yeah. All the rules were rewritten. And that was not lost on kids at that time. And what we did was we scrapped that $10 million renovation expansion project. Um, and I've got one of the teachers from the tech center here who's probably still mad at me about that. Um, but I went to our board, and we have Zealand, and by the way, the ISD have their share board member, Carol Slaw. And we went back to the board and we said, we think we need to go back to the drawing board. It had been 35 years since the public had voted in the millage that supports current technical education in this ISD. So basically this county a little bit bigger. And we've not gone back to them in 35 years and said, what should we be thinking about career tech in, 2000, uh, in 2010 and beyond? And uh, our board said, absolutely, you should do that. And uh, this man actually is the man who uh, walked us through that process at the recommendation of Gary Feenstra. Uh, and in early 2009, Bill came in to the region. Now, this was a much bigger conversation than just one of our school districts. It involved community leaders, corporate leaders, post-secondary leaders, students, parents, teachers from throughout the intermediate school district. And we brought them all back together in a very similar process, a day like this, work groups in between, and then a bookend forum at the end to come back and share their thinking. And a number of things came out of that work uh, that we have been working on ever since. And 
first, and I, I will talk a little bit about that programming down the road, because some of you may have never heard of some of it, some of you will have. It's, they really are models of what Sir Ken Robinson has been talking about in terms of we need to rethink how we're engaging students, and we need to rethink how we're going to deliver pyrotechnical education. But foundational to all of that work is a set of and we don't call them 21st century skills anymore because folks, it's 2013. We are soon going to be talking about 22nd century skills because the kids being born today will see the 22nd century come in. But we don't call them soft skills because that sounds just too fluffy. We call them the skills for success. Thank you. Uh, the first thing we did under this new initiative, the broader name of which is Future Prep, and it's driven by a gentleman in our organization by the name of Jason Posada. Um, the first thing we did was we went back to the whole community, again, business leaders, corporate leaders, civic leaders, community leaders, students, parents, uh, post-secondary. We brought them back in a series of forums over a couple of months and we said, what are the essential skills that regardless of profession or job, all of our students have a right to acquire while they're in our system? and that we have a responsibility to deliver while they're in our system. And what you have, what you see behind me are those seven skill areas called skills for success. Those skills, by the way, were adopted through board resolution by every one of our boards of education in this intermediate school district, including yours. Uh, just two days ago, I presented these skills for success to 14 college and university presidents who are very interested in using them in their core curriculum in West Michigan. The superintendents now in Muskegon ISD have adopted this set of skills, and just last week there went on the table for the Kent ISD superintendents, all of them in Kent County, are also considering the same skill set. And I want to share this with you because there's a lot of talk about we need to talk about these skills for our kids. We've been there, we've done that. We, have just, we are now unpacking these skills at every grade level in terms of what the standard for mastery is. K5, 6, 8, 9, 12. Every one of these has been unpacked in that way. All of our corporate leaders have been involved in this. They've been all unpacked at corporate sites with people from the floor and people from engineering and people from the executive offices coming in to work with our teachers on what those skills look like today. You've had many teachers involved in that process. There's nothing on here that is all that shaking and different from any of the national that you've seen except that I will tell you there are two skill areas on here that have a very distinct West Michigan flavor. And they're the last two. <laughs> oh, see, you already recognized them. Yeah. <laughs> Ethical citizenship. That's, that's us, folks. That's a West Michigan piece. You will see hints of that in the other lists, but not defined like this. This was our corporate civic community leaders, parents and educators coming together and saying that we need to act, we need to ensure that our students can act in a caring and responsible <laughs> manner. And you will not find words like spiritual in any other set of international 21st century standards. Ethical citizenship. The other one is the personal accountability. While that also is hinted at, in other lists of 21st century skills, nowhere is it this clearly defined. And by the way, it wasn't just our corporate um, leaders who were in the room saying, hey, they have to show up to work and they have to show up on time. It was also our teachers and our parents. And oh, by the way, when they're sitting in, in my workplace, they cannot have their face in a phone. They have to communicate. They have to look me in the eyes. They have to engage as human beings. And we have a responsibility to teach them that. So when these were adopted, and I know, I apologize, you can't read all those component parts. You can find them on our website. Um, they, everything that you've probably seen somewhere is in there. And those are now all being defined all the way down to the K3 level on what the standard is, what that looks like for a first grader. What does collaboration look like for a first grader? Well, very, very different than what it looks like for a high school kid. So a little bit, I'm going to be able to describe some of the programs that we have piloted and have launched that you're going to hear about, um, where you'll see that these skills are now becoming embedded in that very different style of delivery. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's important, too, and when you hear some of these program initiatives and stuff like that that they're involved with pretty soon, is that, you know, kind of, kind of what I've seen before was when I saw a list like this, people would say, well, uh, how are we going to tackle this? 
And they said, well, what we ought to do is we ought to have a class on personal accountability. Or we ought to have a class on collaboration. And because we have a class on math, we have a class on English, we have a class, you know, well, just have another class. I'm going, it's just like the wrong paradigm as far as how to get at these things, right? But it's kind of interesting that's what happens. Now we've talked, just kind of, we're going to bring all these kind of things together a little bit. So, you know, the 21st century instruction, as Sarah was talking about, and we start getting into this whole issue of teaching the test, which we, which is an ongoing set of issues, and, and even there's a lot of changes that are going out to the federal legislation right now, good and bad, you know, uh, about all of that. And then, uh, you know, we talk about computers. I mean, in this, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Is sometimes, you know, people think the solution is cooler computers, right? Well, let's, let's just go back just for a minute. You know, back in, uh, I, I, you know, some of you have heard me say this before, but, you know, back in the 1970s when we started with PCs and stuff like that, and there maybe have been one or two or three of them in a school building, and typically there were a couple of people that kind of got into them, and you guys could probably still name those, right? Help me out. What were some of those calls? Commodore, Commodore 64. <laughs> Radio Shack. TRS-80s. TRS-80s. Okay. And basically, there was really no definition to what there was. And then about 1990, what happened was we started getting into a critical mass. You started finding, you know, about 20 or 25 or 30 computers in a school. And so somebody came up with the idea, and it's not saying it's a bad idea, but we'll create a, com a computer lab, right? And so basically, it's kind of like somebody equated this to, uh, why don't we have a telephone lab so we can teach all the kids how to use a telephone, right? But, you know, basically that was kind of the mentality. Now we're still going down the road, and it, here it is in 2013, 2014, and I'm working on a bunch of projects in New Mexico, and they're telling me how many computer labs that they want in their schools. And I'm going, wait a minute, you know, everything's a computer lab at this point. And, uh, and, and so you go through, and then, you know, it's even things like uh, libraries and media centers. You know, what, what's the future role of those? I mean, these are hard, difficult things and affects people's jobs and things that you buy and what you put together and everything else. But after a while, when I can get pretty much the entire University of Michigan library accessed online, I, I don't have a whole lot of reason to go to Michigan library anymore, okay? Now, I'm not saying that that may be the same thing for real young kids, but I mean, you know, especially when you see, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, Google is the best uh, uh, authentication of uh, research. I'm not saying that, but it, it's interesting what's going on that we are constantly messing with these things, but not really necessarily dealing with them. So, you know, then the, the habitats, you know, what are the environments that teachers need? And, uh, and later on, I'm going to show you a few slides. And uh, about two years ago, uh, the Department of Defense, in fact, I'm going to show you a bunch of slides from the Department of Defense. This is kind of interesting. Um, they had an issue about the, the condition of their school buildings for the children of servicemen and women, and mostly overseas. And uh, so this is when, uh, you know, mommy and daddy go off to war in Iraq or Afghanistan and then the kids go to school. And uh, there really hadn't been much attention to improving those school facilities in a long time. And as it turned out, there was a poster child project or situation in Germany where one of the uh, classrooms that uh, these young kids, American kids, were attending class was a former Nazi barrack. And that became the poster child to say, wait a minute, what's going on here? So, you know, it was really interesting that the Department of Defense took a, a very different road here. I was really quite surprised. They basically pulled together a group, a think tank of about 60 people. I mean, it had Pearson, and it had Honeywell, and it had Apple, and it had all the curriculum experts, all the brain research experts, and put them together and basically locked them up, I don't know say it negatively, but put them together for two or three days, three times over a period of three months to start taking a look at you know, what kind of learning environments, how will education be delivered, and what kind of learning environments do we need? And pretty soon I'll show you some of those examples. 
And uh, so it, it's kind of interesting to see how all these pieces are sort of coming together. But I don't think that there's a, a total clarity to this yet. Okay. In fact, there's some other pieces I just want to dovetail into here a minute too because there's competition out there now, folks. There's charter schools. You know, there's, we always had the non-public and the private schools and things, you know, and for a lot of good reasons. I'm, I'm a product of a, since, since we're into all these uh, persons that are, uh, P, uh, what do they call them, PT kids or uh, parents, uh, kids of pre preachers or whatever they were called. And, uh, you know, in, anyway, uh, kids of, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, so, I mean, I have that same kind of background myself, okay? So we've always had that and it's always been kind of a healthy relationship. And now we have more and more schools of choices opening up, even within the public sector, even within the regular public schools, more choices, more options evolving. And then we have the whole choice element between school districts. You know, and uh, it's kind of interesting, even, even in this report that you have in front of you, you take it home and read it, because it's got some interesting data in it. It shows how many kids are coming into Zealand, how many kids are going out of Zealand. And, and some of it's for good reason, because some of the kids actually live a lot closer to Allendale than they do to Zealand or closer to West Ottawa than they do to Zealand and vice versa. You know, some of that's the case. And now when you start adding in technology and online learning, that's a whole other element here. That's a, a competing element. You know, my son, you know, I, I still remember this. He was working on a master's. He wanted to work on a master's program. He lived in Vail, Colorado, a nice place to live. And he says, Dad, I want to get an MBA. And he says, well, here's my choices. And I said, well, tell me. He says, well, I could relocate to uh, Denver and go to uh, Colorado State University and pick up an MBA. Or I could do it online. He says, what do you think? I says, well, that's a very interesting question. I said, 10 years ago, if you asked me that question, I think I would have said you were probably cheating. You know, 10 years from now, if you asked me that question, I would probably ask you, why did you spend the time in the classroom? I mean, this is the dynamics of what's going on. And it doesn't mean that everything's going to go online. And it doesn't mean, but even like uh, in, in talking about the ISD, and talking about how do kids get these uh, opportunities into their, into their program? How do they have time for it? You know, one is maybe they have options of taking some of those things online, or maybe the options are looking at uh, uh, taking some of the core academic classes online. And to open up their schedules and, and get more flex time so that, they, that they're, they have the ability to engage in some of these other things. So, um, so you know, this whole student-centered element, you know, we talked about self-pace and, you know, you know what, what do the environment start looking like that really reinforce that kind of uh, teaching and learning? And, and uh, you know, teaming and collaboration. And, and you know, actually, uh, I've, I've probably said this before, but when I look at, especially at the high school level here with Zealand East and Zealand West, I mean, those, those facilities were designed to embrace collaboration, more collaboration, intensive collaboration, more teaming, if that's what you want to do. This, that, those buildings don't stand in the way of that happening. You talk about blended learning, we talked about that a little bit. And even mobile learning, you know, it's, you know, the big focus that's now starting to evolve nationwide is bring your own device. You know, it's, it used to be, you know, it's like you go to a computer lab, okay, now you get your iPad, well that's kind of a school, and now it's like all these devices that these kids already have, how do we actually integrate that? Instead of taking, instead of going, well you can't bring your cell phone to school, bring your cell phone to school. I mean, it's a whole different thought pattern that's going on here. So anyway, um, you want to talk about this a little bit? Um, so a couple of things that we have, you know, models that we have started to generate in the area that we're learning a lot about. Um, you know, one of the things that we sat back and started talking was, you know, in, in this ISD there are about 8,000 students who are juniors and seniors uh, any year. And we could never build a tech center big enough to put all those 8,000 students in. So that, that, that sort of became a ridiculous notion. There, even if we had all the money, it wouldn't necessarily be the right thing to do, nor would we get all kids to go there. And, and in case you haven't been to the Tech Center lately, um, you should know that probably 75% of our students now attain college credit while they're at the Tech Center. This is not your grandfather's Tech Center, right? It's changed dramatically. 
Um, oh, and by the way, your parents pay thirty-five dollars credit hour for that credit. Uh, so, so there's there's all that going on. But we knew we needed to be more nimble, and we knew we needed to do some di things differently about how we were going to engage kids in learning that embedded them in careers and career exploration that would be meaningful. And I'm only going to give you one example of that. There are several, but it will give you an idea of the kinds of things that we are doing, and they're really focused around some project-based learning. Um, this is how most of us learned. Uh, we went to school, and a teacher taught us a bunch of stuff, and then at the end of the lesson, we did a project, maybe, okay? And a lot of times, the kids who really had resources went home, and the parents helped them with the project, or did the project. <laughs> um, that's how, I mean, does this sound familiar to anybody? Is this how we did school? Okay, so the project was at the end. The project was dessert, maybe if there was time. Project-based learning turns that model on its ear. It turns it the opposite way around. Project, the project becomes the method upon which the kids learn the content. So it's exactly the opposite. So dessert's the entree. And uh, there are whole schools modeled after this. They're called New Tech Highs. You happen to have one not too far from here. Um, but we knew and the, the learning that happens under project-based learning is very different, is very student-focused, it's very student-engaged. You have to teach differently and, because, and the students will learn very differently in, in the environment. But we knew we were not going to get 8,000 kids in a project-based learning environment, nor could we get all the teachers trained at once. Uh, to truly be trained in project-based learning, you need to go through something like the Buck Institute training out of California, um, which really drives that learning. Those two eighth grade teachers in Hamilton, by the way, were two of our superstars in the very first year of I Challenge You. And that's the program I'm going to talk about for just a second, because it will give you an idea of the models that are happening in your community um, that are really changing and putting on its head how students are learning. Um, what we decided to do is take project-based learning and do it a little differently. It's a summer class. So we're outside the traditional piece, it's not class at all actually. Um, we take applications from students, and they're going to be incoming juniors and seniors. And what we do, they don't know each other, they come from all over the ISD, we put them on teams of five to six students. And we pair them up with a master teacher who's been trained at, through the Buck Institute, we bring that training in by the way to the region, and we pay for it at the ISD. <coughs> by the way, there's no cost with the steady student. And then we put those students and teachers together, and we pair them with a business. Uh, in the first year, which was last year, we had six businesses involved. This year, 13. And right now, we're already having businesses call us to be a part of this for next year. And what happens in those two weeks is that the kids earn four credit hours of Grand Rapids Community College Entrepreneurial Business Credit. And they work with those businesses, they go in. So instead of being asked to solve a, a, a made up fictitious problem from somewhere out there in teacher land, and I, and I say that with all respect, but that's what new techs do. These kids go into Gentex and Herman Miller and Hayworth and Holland Hospital and Farm Bureau, Zealand Farm Bureau, and they have two weeks to formulate recommendations on a real problem faced by that business or industry or employer. <coughs> two weeks. When we were first designing the program, I went to uh, an individual in Indiana, Dr. Drake, Dave Dressler, who is the uh, executive director of the Center for Educational Learning in Indiana, former superintendent up here, who was really involved in new tech stuff. And I said, Dave, this is what we're thinking about doing. And he goes, well, how long do you, he said, this would be really a national model, because nobody is sending kids into business and industry. They're going to be scared to death of you. They're going to be scared to death of these kids. I said, yeah, I know. He goes, how long are you thinking? And I said, three weeks. He goes, oh my goodness, Karen. He said, three weeks, kids can solve world peace and world hunger. <laughs> Way too long. You'll bore them to tears. Two weeks. He has you problem. You'll have two problems. If you give them too much time, they get bored. And those businesses will not give them problems that are tough enough. I guarantee you. So we launched I Challenge You in the first year. Six teams last year. Actually, 12 teams and six businesses. This year, it was 13 teams and 13 businesses. And the kids come together, and they don't know each other, and they don't know the problem, and they don't know the company, and they don't know the teachers. And what is produced in two weeks, in addition to earning four college credits, would blow you away. Some of you have seen these presentations. When you realize at the end, because there is actually a competition at the end for scholarships, because this is America. And we can eat. <laughs> There's a competition at the end for scholarships, and what those kids present to those judges is 
it's, it's mind boggling. We hear, this is two weeks folks, we hear, this is what we hear from the kids. I learned more in two weeks than I did all last year in school. Ouch. The kids tell us, I felt respected wherever I went. We, buy, we get them team shirts, by the way. They're beautiful polo shirts with little brighter name of the company on the side. So there is no, you have no idea who has any resources at home, who doesn't have any resources at home. They're just allowed to be those kids in that environment. I felt respected because they thought I had ideas about something that mattered. And I learned more than I've learned in ages. Here's what parents tell us. What did you do to my kid? My kid hasn't talked this much in years to me about school. What did you do? They've been talking nonstop about school. It's not school. They're not, anyway, they never enter a classroom in those two weeks. So that's what we hear. You have the businesses? Kids are brilliant. Where'd you get these kids? These kids are brilliant. The first year they said, yeah, okay, this is easy to do when you get a bunch of four-point kids studying. Average GPA was 275. Blew us away. The kids were brilliant. And you know what the teachers tell us? These are a bunch of type A teachers. These are a bunch of teachers who are used to standing up at the front of that class and commanding everything that happens. Those teachers had a, because that's not how you teach under PBL, those teachers will tell you now, they could never go back in the classroom and teach the same way again. That's a two-week experience. We have the capacity, the expertise, the resources in our school districts to turn this whole thing on its ear and engage kids in a way that they haven't been engaged in a very long time in our classrooms. They have lost the connection between the curriculum they're learning and the relevance to anything else coming at them in life. Those of you who attended the uh, Mayor Dykstra's Youth Forum in Holland last spring heard kid after kid after kid say, nothing I'm learning is relevant to me. I don't understand how it's relevant. And this community is wrapping around how we're going to change all that. We don't have a lot of time. I want to show you a quick video. Um, which is going to push out even what Sarah Easter was talking about in technology because it re it ha it'll have you re really thinking about how much time you could potentially get back to do some of these relevant, engaging things with kids. And if you don't think that this is possible, how many of you have a Fitbit? Or anything like that? Okay, okay. So how many of you love a little message it sends you in the morning? I mean, this morning mine said, love you, Karen. And, you know, he doesn't say that. He just a little thing posts that says, love you, Karen. And, and I said, love you, too. And my husband was behind me going, who are you talking to? <laughs> so technology is catching up with us in terms of, I know you didn't get your steps in yesterday, Karen. Step it up today. So let's watch this video. It's called Digital Aristotles by CGP Gray. If you have any time later, you're going to want to YouTube any CGP Gray videos and take a look at how he is approaching teaching and learning. Hello, Internet. Recently, YouTube invited me to California for a conference with a bunch of really interesting people. There were many talks and giant balloons and much discussion of what the future of education might look like, which is no small issue because how society raises the next generation of scientists, doctors, and programmers shapes the future of human civilization. It was an amazing few days, and if you'll tolerate my ramblings, I'd like to share some of my thoughts on this as someone who's worked as an educator both in and out of schools. This is how schools have pretty much always looked, a guy in the front who knows all the things and students who don't, so the guy tells them. But a teacher explains things at the right pace for maybe one student in the room during a lesson. Everyone else is either bored because they already understand the material or lost because they're missing knowledge they should already have. But at the end of the lesson, regardless of student understanding, the curriculum marches relentlessly on. And whether the teacher uses a blackboard, whiteboard, or smartboard, and whether the students use tablets, paper, or tablets again, this system isn't really any different. It's just technology doing the same thing in a shinier way. But the internet is different, and behind the scenes something interesting is happening that hints at the shape of things to come. 
In a perfect school, each student would have a personal tutor, like Aristotle to Alexander the Great. But if your education policy is Aristotle for everyone, then there are three big problems with this. First, there aren't enough humans on Earth to individually tutor every child, and even if there were, it would be horrifically expensive. And even if neither manpower nor money was a problem, not everyone is as good a tutor as Aristotle. But technology is solving these problems, starting with number one. For who needs humans when the internet can teach you all the things? Want to learn calculus? Get started. Need an AP Biology course? Go watch this one along with hundreds of thousands of other students. The internet massively multiplies the audience of potential teachers and solves the manpower problem. But isn't cheerleading the internet the same thing I was complaining about before? New tech doing old things just with more shiny? After all, if you were a pre-internet child with bookish inclinations, there's always been a place to teach you all the things. And people thought that radio and TV were going to revolutionize education by giving teachers huge audiences, but here we still are. These are good points, but the internet also solves the cost problem in a way that radio and TV never could. Real shows are expensive to make, and even the best of educational TV TV often gets pushed aside for dumber, more popular stuff that, not coincidentally, is also more profitable. This is known as the History Channel effect. But the cost to access the internet is only going down, as is the cost to make stuff for the internet. Which is why a guy with some paper and a marker in his bedroom can pull in a million views a month at essentially zero cost, and doesn't have to worry about competition from stuff like this. So the internet solves problems one and two, but educational videos still aren't personalized to students. And that leaves YouTube as a library of video, not a tutor like Aristotle. But you can build on top of YouTube, and what I see coming is this. Digital Aristotle for Everyone, a computer program that tutors students individually by pulling from a library of videos like YouTube, a program that tests students on what they know, and more importantly, adapts to the way they learn over time by comparing the effectiveness of different videos and different tests to discover, scientifically, what works best. This isn't a fantasy, there are people building parts of this right now, even if Digital Aristotle isn't their explicit goal. And one of these places is the Khan Academy, which is more than just Saul's soothing voice. If this does not blow your mind, you have no emotion. Behind the website is incredibly complicated software testing everything about student learning, the effectiveness of different videos, different tests, and different ways of asking questions. And while it may seem primitive now, technology only gets better faster. When Digital Aristotle arrives, it will be cheaper, less labor-intensive, and better than human teachers ever could be. I often hear the argument that Digital Aristotle or something like it will free teachers to float around the classroom helping kids work on interesting projects, and while that might happen in the near term, I don't think that's the long term reality. For what happens when Digital Aristotle truly knows students better than the teacher? When for every topic of human endeavor it's able to take the best and brightest kids further down the path of knowledge than their teachers ever could? I doubt that schools will go away. After all, they aren't just about learning, but also freeing parents to work in the economy while their feral children are turned into civilized adults. But schools will be radically different, and there will be far fewer teachers working in them doing far less. And while that's not great news for teachers, it's awesome news for students and society. Right now, if you're a student doing poorly, school moves on without you. And if you're doing well, school holds you back. In the future, I see every human using a digital Aristotle for their whole life, a tutor personalized to them, teaching them exactly what they need to learn when they're best ready for it. And when that comes, we'll have both a better educational system and a better society. I want to thank YouTube EDU and the people who ran it for bringing me out to California to meet up with these awesome people. I had more interesting conversations over the space of a few days than I normally get to have over the space of a few months. If you want to see what the best of education looks like right now, go check out their channels. And if you want to hear more on this topic, I put together a playlist of talks that I hope you like. So, to draw those two conversations together, we can argue till the cows come home whether this is going to become a reality or not. I will tell you that my Fitbit knows when I haven't walked 10,000 steps a day. So, I would suggest to you that this is probably going to become a reality. You know, there's a question we asked at the back table, just because we can, should we? However, what this allows us to potentially do down the road, if we have this kind of capacity, 
coming at us digitally is to rethink everything that's happening within the walls of the school as student engagement forums. Because that's the stuff that can be taught. But anything you saw in that first list of skills, those seven skill set areas that employers are demanding and we know our kids will need to navigate an economy and a world coming at them, you don't learn those sitting at a computer. That's the engagement piece and the relationship piece that is the value add of the school of the future, in my humble opinion. Fortunately, we are starting to model some of those things right now. Those two weeks that I challenge you is, a, is an eight to five program. What the teachers will tell you is the kids start showing up at 7 a.m. because they can't wait to get started. And they have to boot them out at eight o'clock at night. So they go home and they sleep and they eat. If we could create that kind of engagement in students around solving a problem that's academic and they're learning while they're doing it, then we have a lot that we can move forward in this region about making, allowing that to happen and still maintaining a purpose for public education, which is to produce those well-rounded and prepared citizens who have more going for them than just a lot of content. All right, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's stop it right there, okay? Um, again, both uh, Karen and I are not trying to say things to try to get you to agree to a certain path of what the future should be and what the Zealand Public Schools should do. What we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of push you out there, I'm not to say push you over the edge, but push you out there a little further than what maybe has been done before, okay? And, you know, it's like my brother-in-law, uh, he finally got an iPad the other day and and he didn't know how to use um, uh, FaceTime. So I, you know, I said, well, here's how to use FaceTime on an iPad. And, and he came up to me, he says, you know, 30 years ago, Bill, you were talking about at some point we're going to be talking to each other on a phone and looking at each other, OK? Well, yeah. Now, it's kind of interesting in listening to Bruce, you know, what is it? Is it 30 years from now, maybe 20 years from now, that we've got a car that's driving itself, a Google car? I mean, well, we've had airplanes that have been on autopilot for quite a while, right? I mean, it's uh, now when we see this stuff like digital Aristotle, I mean, this whole issue, how many of you are familiar like, with this uh, initiative out there called the School of One? Any of you? Okay, a couple. Okay, this is a big initiative. I started out at New York City Schools. It's all dealing with the area of mathematics. And what they did is they took a whole bunch of textbook writers and they took a look at all the textbooks and they developed 25,000 modules of mathematics of what were the best modules to learn mathematics. And it has all built into it, all the learning styles and everything else. And it's basically doing what Digital Aristotle is doing. This is already, and they're now starting to go nationwide with this initiative. So I don't think this is that far out. You know, I mean, as far as looking at learning styles and everything else, uh, I mean, even if you've worked in special ed, I mean, you know, there's a lot of kids that are in special ed that have a unique learning style, quite honestly. That's, uh, that's their disability is that, you know, that, that they have a different learning style than what other kids have. And so, I mean, we're not trying to, you know, put everybody under a hair dryer in the beauty saloon and somehow or other your, your mind's going to get programmed. You know, I'm not, I'm not, that's not what we're thinking here, okay? But on the other hand, there's tools, what's that? Beauty salon. Beauty salon, okay. What did I say, saloon? <laughs> that's good. I'm sorry. But that's, that may be there too. Who knows? That's, a, that's good. Okay. But anyway. The question is, when you start thinking about all of this, I'm sorry, okay. The question is, when you start thinking about all this, take a look at the next questions on the questionnaire. And there's two questions. And, uh, and it talks about, you know, what programs and services does this potentially impact within the Zealand Public Schools? Another thing that we're going to be looking at to some extent is how does this start impacting school facilities, which I was going to do a whole presentation on, we don't have time for it. Okay, and then after we do that, we're going to have, uh, I'm going to throw in another concept or an idea or whatever. It's, it's uh, you know, the school administration board and everybody else hasn't been just sitting idly by not thinking about these things. In fact, there are some strategic initiatives that they have started to bubble up and looking at. 
And we're going to start looking at some of that to get some input on which of these initiatives do you think are really more important than others. So start working on the two questions that are on the next, next discussion page and we'll go from there. So we're about five minutes behind, but we'll make it up. We've got plenty of time. We're doing fine. Thank you very much. And Karen, thank you so much too.